Hey everybody, this is Eric Taylor. I'm the founder and owner of Salon Republic, and I'm here at Salon Republic's Beverly Hills Wilshire location with none other than Andrew from Andrew Does Hair. Thank you so much Thanks for, for making me. the drive and coming and doing this with us. So many people love to hear what you have to say, and uh, so I'm grateful for the time. So, uh, Andrew, tell us your story. How did you get started in hair, and how did you get to the level that you're at now? Sorry, I get to hold the mic. You do, the, the uh, very fancy mic. All right, I'll try to make this the quickest version I can. I tend to ramble, and hopefully you can edit it down into something useful. So, when I was in high school, I didn't do very good. I, was, I always had a hard time following the rules, doing what I was told. I ended up dropping out when I was a senior, and around that time, I was cutting my own hair and friend's hair in the bathroom, and uh, I wanted to go to barber school because I was, I was 17 and insecure, and I was so afraid that if I was a hairdresser, people would think I was gay. Now I could care less, but you know that's how a 17-year-old thinks. Anyway, so I couldn't find a barber school around me, and I was only interested in doing men's hair, but I found a cosmetology school, and I thought, whatever, it's good enough. So in cosmetology school, they taught me you know, long hair, short hair, cut, color, highlights, extensions, everything. And I, I knew how to do a wet set, I knew how to use a curling iron, but I only wanted to do men's hair. However, my teachers told me that I wouldn't make money doing men's hair and that I, I should you know, learn to do color better and because and, I was never good at color. And they were always like, oh, you'll get it, you'll get it. And I never got it. So when I, when I got my license, I went to a barber shop and they wouldn't hire me because I was a cosmetologist and not a barber. So I ended up at a salon where my boss said, you're doing whatever comes in the door because I was working on commission. So for five years I struggled and I did everything that came in the door and I used to like, have panic attacks in the back room when I would have to do women's hair. Uh, haircuts I was okay with, but if they wanted it curled afterward, I didn't know how to use a curling iron very well. If, if I had to do highlights, like literally half the time, it, it was a refund and I was surprised I didn't get fired. <laughs> but after enough time, what it started happening is when guys would come in for a haircut, they would come back four out of five times and they would bring friends where if, if five women came in for haircuts, one of them would come back and it was because it wasn't even because she liked her hair, it's because she thought I was cute or something. Uh, back in those days, I was better looking. But uh, we all were. Anyways, so I just accidentally kind of gravitated toward. I, I always wanted to do men's hair, but I was forced to learn styling and women's hair. And before Instagram, before I was connected to anybody, I just did what I knew worked. If somebody brought me a picture of David Beckham's long, soft, loose hair that was voluminous and. I knew how to do it. I knew how to blow dry it and round brush it and tease it and use whatever powder and whatever whatever is required to do it. And I didn't realize that the majority of barber shops and like men's hair sources were like wet styling everybody. Uh, and so when I got on Instagram talking about good hair doesn't come from a jar, blow dry the hair, I didn't realize that it was so rare. And uh, you know, people are like, oh, what's your secret for getting big on Instagram? And I'm like, I just. I style hair, or I styled hair in a world where people were focusing on a fade, and that, that was it. I just I stood out by accident. It wasn't some great plan that I was like, oh, the, the industry's missing this, and I'm going to be that. It was just what I happened to accidentally be forced to learn over the years paid off a lot. And uh, so that's my whole story. That's kind of how I got here. After So I got like 10,000 followers on Instagram kind of by accident. And when like, did you start on Insta? I don't know, like four or five years ago. Okay. So uh, I, I wasn't, early. it was relatively early. I wouldn't say that I was like one of the first on there. Like I know Anthony the Barber was on there way before me, uh, Anthony the Barber 916. And uh, I, I know a few other guys were on there way before me, but I was on kind of early. But the thing is I got 10,000 followers by accident and it bothered me that I didn't know why it happened. People would go, how'd you get a follower? And I'm like, or how'd you get a following? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. So I started reading books by like Seth Godin and Malcolm Gladwell and Gary Vaynerchuk and, and Jim Collins. And I, and I started reading all these guys trying to figure out what I did so I could do more of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I guess that's sort of the end. You know, I, 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 think, that's, I think that's amazing okay. that you, you know, had the curiosity uh, to the point at which you went out and you spent a lot of time reading books because I'm not a fast reader. It, it takes me well, quite a while. Audio books. <laughs> audio yes, books. I, I do audio books and I do lots of podcasts, but um, you know, you, I love how you were very intentional about how you went out and you studied it, right? And, and that's, that's really fantastic, so kudos to you. So um, what about influences on your, on your career th thus far? Who's been the, the biggest influence and why? So as far as business, I would have to say Tab Salzman. He goes by Tab Cuts Hair on Instagram. A uh, whole backstory about him that I'll try to make quick. I, his cousin was a friend of mine from when I was in cosmetology school. And so this friend was always like, oh, my cousin's been doing hair two years. You should go talk to him about things. And uh, 
he actually came into my bedroom like right when I got my license and taught me on my friend how to blow dry hair better. Hmm. So the guy started showing me things from early on and then we kind of lost touch. And, and the next time I talked to him, he had gone from like $30 haircuts to like $150 haircuts. And uh, I was always a little bit intimidated by him because of that. Like he, was, he just got really successful really fast. And I reached a point in my own career where I was charging $25 a haircut. I was booked all day, every day. And I didn't know how to make more money. I couldn't make more hours in the day. I didn't know how to raise my prices. Mm -hmm. So I, I reached out to Tab and I said, hey, like, I literally, I said, I'm going to buy you tacos. And when I showed up, I brought a notebook and we just sat and, and he gave me, he gave me so much advice and none of it had to do with the haircut. It was all mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was like the moment that my career changed. It was, it was the moment where I was like, wait a minute, if Andrew wants a price raise, Andrew has to do something different. Mm -hmm. Before that, I had always looked at like, oh, well, if I get this certificate or take this class or, or change my title, then I can raise my prices. But this guy was like, no, 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 you do, do a $50 haircut for long enough and you'll have to charge $50 in order to keep appointments available. And so he kind of, that was like the biggest kickstart to get me thinking differently and thinking constantly about everything I could do for my career. Uh, so he would absolutely be my biggest influence uh, business-wise. And then as far as creativity and like technical skill and, and taste more than anything would be Jody Taylor from London. That guy is incredible. He's like five years ahead of the rest of us with style. Mm -hmm. Like he just does stuff where you look at it and you go, I can't tell if that's really not cool or so cool that I just don't get it. And he mm -hmm. does that like regularly. And it's almost like he doesn't have his finger on the pulse of what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. He's just in his own bubble, like doing what he thinks is cool. And then you see it like on the runway a year later. I love it. I love it. Okay. So, um, what are you really excited about nowadays with hair? The thing I'm excited about for myself personally is finally taking my own advice about a lot of these things and raising my prices and cutting back my hours and making opportunities to do the kind of work that I like to do. Uh, my absolute favorite thing in the world to do is a haircut with no time limit where I can just have fun with it. My least favorite thing in the world to do is a haircut when I'm running late and there's two people waiting. And so I'm finally getting to a point where like I work 10 to 16 hours a week and I take an hour plus per head and I just take my time and the people who wanna be there really wanna be there. So that excites me. Like the fact that I've spent the last 13 years almost sort of on an assembly line, every half hour, haircut, haircut, haircut. And in the beginning it was like, okay, I need to do 30 haircuts a day if I need to make enough money. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, now I can kind of pick and choose the, the looks I wanna do. Like, I can do a bald fade, but I don't love doing them. So I no longer go out of my way to do them. Uh, I like... You, you don't love doing them because you've done so many? Uh, or because it, you don't like the look? I'm, I'm, oh, personally, I'm not a fan of the look, but it's huge. It's all over yeah. everything now. And, and it's honestly, it's like a, there's a bit of a pissing contest involved with how clean can your fade be. Sure. Which I freaking <laughs> loathe. Like, I don't want to be a part of those circles. So I, I deliberately do choppy fades now mm -hmm. um, just to make people who can't see outside of that pissing contest go, wait, wait, why is this guy successful? His fade sucks. And I'm like, that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, You're contrarian. Yeah, I just, it's it's a stumbling block, block for so many hairstylists and barbers to, to get that perfect technical haircut. And then they spend 30 years just striving for perfection to some inhuman level that they forget they're selling haircuts to humans. Mm -hmm. And they forget that when you look at a picture of Brad Pitt or David Beckham or Ryan Gosling or any of those guys, Justin Timberlake, like none of them have perfect fades. But, and that's, those are the haircuts people are bringing us. Hey, give me this. And it's like, all right, I'll give you the most perfect fade. But like, really look at that picture. They don't have perfect fades. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I got sidetracked there. So I'm really excited about being able to do more of the work that I like to do and not have to do work that I have to do. Uh, I mean, it's taken me 13 years to get to that point. And honestly, it's not paying right now. I don't know if I should share all that, but most of the haircuts I do, I do for free. Uh, almost everything I do in my studio, I don't charge for. In fact, wow. I'll give them product um, just because I want to do it so bad. I'm like, no, 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 make, make the drive all the way out to me. I'll give you product. I'll, uh, you know, but the, the catch is they have to be photogenic to some degree. Of course, <laughs> of course. But as far as the industry as a whole or, or the other part of my career, because that's the other thing is like as I, as I made this change in my career six months ago, the reason I did it is from to, in the salon from, from to, being in the salon 40 yeah. to 50 hours a week to now I cut hair 10 or 16 hours a week. Right. I didn't do it so that I could chill all the time. Like a lot of my friends and acquaintances have been like, Oh, how's vacation been? And I'm like, dude, I, I've spent an average of 15 hours a week with my nose in a book, in a blog, in a video, trying to learn how to take a better photo and share what I'm, what I do better. And I'll talk about yeah. that later. Reading more of these 
books about marketing and business and spreading yeah. ideas, writing curriculum to, <laughs> I got this idea, man. I got this. Like if you look <laughs> at my office right now, it looks like a beautiful mind. I have like, yeah. like just notes written and stuck on the walls. Mad and like, scientist. Like it looks insane right now, but you know, I, I have a tendency, like I, I, I look for problems and I try to figure out ways to fix them. And what I'm excited about right now is I've been watching more and more acquaintances and friends get where they want to go in hair. And I, I guess the way that I would break it down is your, your effort to income, your grind to income ratio improves. Sure. And for some people, they're geared in a way where I know people who could do 50 haircuts in a day. They work next to a military base and they do a one and a three all day mm -hmm. and they love it and they love the pace and they love that they don't have to have a lot of small talk because their head's in and out of the chair in eight minutes. Yeah. And if that's what it takes for you to not feel like you're grinding, because to me, sometimes sitting and having a conversation, that's the grind. Um, so if, if you can figure out a way to make that work for you, freaking cool. Or like the opposite end of the spectrum, like if I have to do more than five haircuts in a day, I'm like, Ugh. but I like to spend an hour and a half and chat and and mm -hmm. do this for 20 minutes before we do the haircut. Mm -hmm. And so uh, th I've been through, through the, the classes I've done and I guess the content that I post and even like some one-on-one -on -one coaching I've done with people, I've watched them move toward an improved grind to income ratio, which mm -hmm. is like now my ultimate goal. Like I don't care about doing a better haircut. I don't care about making a better product. I care that every individual behind the chair has their ideal career because I think if that happens and see when I first started doing all of this outside of the salon stuff my big hang up was wait do I do something and reach out to consumers mm -hmm. like like slick hair tv or or any of these youtubers bloggers who right. who talk directly to the clients and right. say hey here's how you style your hair here's the product you use I was like do I do something like that or do I keep it in the industry and what I realized is if we can fix if we could fix people's personal problems behind the chair like the the technicians and get them on their proper effort to grind ratio, it fixes the client's problems. Because honestly, like there's no bad hair cutters out there. You're just in the wrong chair. I couldn't do a one and a three as good as somebody who does it all day. Sure. But I charge 10 times as much as that person. Am I a ripoff? Yes, mm -hmm. to that person I am. Sure. So it's, you know, I think everybody has this, I'm um, going into too much detail so here, but. One, one theme that I'm picking up on is that you love to learn. I like to learn and I like to share what I've learned. I mean, right. I'm that guy like, I have to censor myself a lot because I'll be, the reason I had to redo this interview is what some of the things I said last time, I was like writing these ideas and they weren't ready to be out yet. Sure. But, but I, like to, I like to learn things and then teach them. Like right. I, don't, I don't really, I, actually I think uh, Carlos Sugar Skulls told me, um, don't hold on to anything, just give it all away and it, yeah. and it comes back to you. And right. it's kind of what I do, like I'm just like it. talking all the time. Uh, absorb, process create and then push back out. Yeah, right? and then like the money will come and the following will come right. as it needs to. Right, awesome. Okay, so we have a lot of really, really great questions that were uh, sent to us on Instagram. So uh, Andrew is gonna go through them and answer them uh, rapid fire unless, unless it's a larger topic. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the ones that are joke questions. <laughs> joke. What did you have for dinner? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, J. A. Barber says, uh, "When are you posting more videos on YouTube?" Ah, jeez. Okay, so when I when I made this transition out of the salon, my plan was like, "I'm gonna have a new new YouTube video every week." Uh, I didn't have any idea how much work goes into making and and putting together a video. So like some of the first videos I did, like I did one with just one camera, like we have here now, and somebody commented like, "This is boring. You need a second angle." So I went out and I bought a second camera. And then the very first comment on that video was like, these angles are bad. And I was and I, like, the haters are just so vicious on, on Instagram or on YouTube that now I'm just like, okay, I'm gonna sit back and keep working on this until I can do a really, really good video, then I'll put more out. But also I, I, I underestimated how much effort goes into making videos. So I would like to do them as soon as possible. But the other difficult thing is, I don't know who I need to make videos for. Like, I don't wanna teach other barbers clients what that barber should be teaching them. Uh, I, I think that that's wrong on a lot of levels. Like to me, it's like, like every client should trust their barber or their stylist for their hair needs. And it's like, to me, it just feels, it feels wrong for me to go, hey, yeah, yeah, go to that guy for a haircut, but come to me to know what product to use, to know how to use a blow dryer. Like it doesn't feel right. So I don't know if I wanna do videos like that. And I don't know if I wanna do videos for, for the professional. So I don't know, I, I guess I just, with YouTube, I just don't know. It's all, it's all a test and it's like trial and error. And some days I just wake up with an itch and I'm like, I wanna make a video today and I'll go cut a mannequin head. So it's kind of just, 
as, as it works out. A lot of uh, when you come into Canada, when you come into, would you ever consider come to New York? Yeah. Joe Bruno, uh, uh, barber here in the salon, uh, and he asks, Andrew, you stated that, quote, if you are too busy and stressed at your current prices, you cannot afford to work at that price anymore, end quote. How do you make that jump and not worry about losing clients? Okay, that, I, when I read that, I was like, oh, I'm really excited to answer this. If you're too busy, you need to lose clients. That's why you raise your prices. You, you can't be, it's, it's business. You, don't, you can't be everybody's friend and just keep hooking them up when you're like pulling your hair out because you're so stressed. You need less clients. You know, at the end of a day where you've done so many haircuts that you go home just like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sleep for three days now. When your feet hurt, when you're tired, what are you thinking in the back of your head? I wish I had to do less haircuts. So you need to lose those clients. And it's, what I always recommend to people is when you start raising your price and, prices and trimming off the clients, uh, have, have a, a side barber to send them to. Like have somebody you know and trust does good work and say, and what I say is not like, I don't go, hey, if you can't afford me now, go to this guy. What I say is, hey, what if, if the service I'm offering doesn't fit for you, I highly recommend Brian or I highly recommend Dre or I highly recommend whoever it is. Uh, so you don't need to feel bad, it's business. And like exactly like you posed in the question here, you cannot afford to do as many haircuts as you've been doing if it's stressing you out because it's, it's taking your life out of you. It's taking your, the time out of your day. And you only, we all only have 24 hours in a day. So, so at what level um, sh should someone feel comfortable enough to raise prices? Is it 75% of their schedule is booked? Is it 90%? Is it 50%? Well, what would you say? Oh, geez. I, I've always done it when I get to the point where clients are leaving because of the wait. So if I have a two week wait, people will wait that. If I have a six week wait, I can hear people on the, well, when my receptionist would get the phone, I could hear people go, six weeks? No, I'll, I'll go somewhere else. So when you're losing people over the weight, you need to raise your prices to make the weight shorter. To, you need to raise your prices to lose some clients to make the weight shorter. And the other thing too is a lot of people are afraid to raise their prices because they're like, oh, people aren't gonna tip as much or people are gonna think I'm too cool. Yeah. But when I raise, every time I raise my prices, my tips get bigger and people are more appreciative and believe it or not. So I, I currently charge $100 and I, I used to charge $25 freaking six years ago. Sure. Some of my clients who are still with me who used to pay $25 are glad that they pay 100 now because now when they call for an appointment, they can get in at the end of the week. Where when I charge $30, they'd call and it was six weeks. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you get your diehard fan clients, they stick when your prices go up. And the ones who, and it's not that, it's not a personal thing. It's not like, oh, they, they think I'm too cool or I don't, they, I don't think they're cool enough. It's not that, it's business. It's like, like I said earlier, uh, I could do a, a one and a three, but it would be a ripoff because almost anybody can do a one and a three so you can get it done for cheaper. When the people want what only you can do, they'll pay what they have to pay to get it in a reasonable amount of time. And so there's like a sweet spot. If you go too expensive, you'll sit around and do nothing. And I've learned that the hard way. Uh, the first time I tried to go charge $100, I wasn't booked half the day. And I made less that day after paying my rent and paying travel fees to get into that salon. I made less that day than I would have made charging $30 at my old salon. So. Okay, so Wes the Barber asks, is there any benefit to having a few different types of haircut services over just one? I've been thinking of offering an hour long service for a higher price in addition to my standard 45 minute service at my regular price. The reason is I don't have enough time in 45 minutes to do everything I wanna do service wise and an hour would allow me more time to fit the stuff in. Okay, so what I started doing right before I left my salon, I was, I was getting really, really busy and I would run late most days and it was stressing me out. And I started realizing that there were two specific instances that would cause me to run late. Well, three, one of them was clients showing up late, which I absolutely did not tolerate. If you were not in my chair at the moment of your appointment, you weren't getting a haircut that day, uh, which is, I feel bad saying because I got here 45 minutes late today. Uh, but uh, well, we, we were actually late too. But what I would do with those clients is I would reschedule them for as soon as possible, usually fit them, at the, fit them in at the end of the next day, but I, I couldn't allow myself to run late because of that. But the other thing I started noticing is if I needed to do a bald fade and a blow dry, I would run late. I couldn't fit it in my regular service. Or if I had a brand new client and they, I, I started to get to a point where every new client came in, they wanted like the full styling lesson, which I'm happy to give, but it would make me run late. I'd spend 15 minutes explaining how to use a blow dryer, so I'd run late. So what I started doing is I told my clients, 
you know, it's a half hour for 40 bucks or it's an hour for 80 bucks. If you want a bald fade or a design and a style, you book an hour. If you book a half hour and you ask for those things, no, you get a bald fade or a style. And same thing if you're a brand new client, uh, and my, my receptionist would ask people this, have you been to Andrew before? No, this is my first time. Okay, you have to book an hour the first time, which was great because then at that point I was too busy anyways, and it cut down my influx of new clients. And then when I did have a new client, I had more time to get to know them, more time to teach them how to style their hair. So I, I definitely think it's cool to have tiered services like that. Uh, one thing that I learned, I went into a pretty fancy salon one time and I paid $155 to get my hair cut just because I wanted to see what a $155 haircut looked like. And at that time I was charging 40. So while I was sitting in the salon, I noticed on their menu that the owner of the salon charged $800 for a haircut. And granted, maybe he did one a month or maybe he did 50 a month, I don't know. But what I knew is on that menu, there was something for $800 and I was about to get a service there and it made me feel really cool. So after that, I, I added on my service um, so even though like I, I book an hour for a hundred bucks, but if you want, well, how do I do it? If you want to text me for an appointment outside of the already available appointments, that's $200. Mm -hmm. Or if you want a house call, that's $500. So sure. I have a $500 item on my price list, which nobody's ever bought, but it's up there. Yeah. Just, to, just to say it, it's like yeah. when you go to Vegas and they have like the thousand dollar burger on the menu right. <laughs> that you have to like pre-book to eat. Right, it's like a really expensive toll road. Nobody's yeah. actually taking it, but it's there. But it's there. Okay, so uh, one more question, uh, and then we're gonna come back to these because I wanna get to more of these. So Jeshi writes, how do you know when a haircut is finished? It's easy to get stuck refining and refining or getting stuck trying to perfect something, but only any, ending up creating more work. At the same time, not leaving a cut unfinished. I, I guess I do, I do three different kinds of haircuts. So one is for a paying client who needs to get in and out in a specific, specific amount of time. That haircut, I try to cut every hair once. I think about the whole haircut and I spend two extra minutes planning it and then I just, I execute it. The other haircut that I do is on stage when I'm teaching or in front of a camera or in front of a class. That's a totally different haircut. That one, I kind of make it up as I go along and, and try to hit the different techniques that I need to demonstrate. And then the third haircut is if I'm doing something for a photo shoot, which is what I do mostly now. It's that kind of haircut. And in those haircuts, it's more like what you're talking about where it's, you don't know exactly when it's finished. You just keep working on it. And for me, like the, absolute core of the way that I cut hair, especially because I work with shorter hair so much, is the way it moves. I stop and I move the hair, and I stop and I move the hair, and I stop and I move the hair, and if it's moving the way I want it to move, that's how I know when I'm done. I'll stop and stand back and just use a blow dryer to push the hair around, and if it falls the way I want it to, it's done. I love that. Okay, so what we're going to do now is um, we're going to um, ask for your advice on photography, because I think most of us know that you're you're probably a pseudo professional photographer, right? Certainly a very good amateur photographer and so many hairdressers struggle with taking good pictures. So um, we're gonna go to a few different conditions that you might find in your salon. Uh, a condition where we have natural light, a condition where uh, you don't have natural light and then we're gonna go outside and we're gonna see what Andrew advises as far as taking pictures in each of those environments, okay? Does that sound, does that sound good? Oh, is that how you wanna do this? That's how we're gonna do this. So we're gonna cut, and then we're gonna to go to these different uh, places. Okay. okay. All right.